In this short video, we're going to continue our discussion of systems of differential equations where we write them in matrix form. And we're going to start with our homogeneous systems uh, where we have real and distinct eigenvalues. So in matrix form, our homogeneous system is written as x prime equals ax. And what do we mean by eigenvalues and eigenvectors in this context? Well, we start by assuming that the solution can be written in the form of, well, each component is going to be a constant times e to the lambda t, which is a lambda is a number that we've yet to de determine. And then all of the constants k1 through kn are yet to be determined. So we can just factor out to the e to the lambda t, and we'll write the vector of constants using an uppercase k. So we're going to assume that the solution uppercase x is a vector k times e to the lambda t. All right, so then uh, if I take the derivative, need an arrow there. Uh, x prime is going to be lambda times k e to the lambda t. And substitute both of those back into the differential equation. And then I can go ahead and factor out the e to the lambda t. That's never going to be zero, right? So uh, I can essentially divide out the e to the lambda t. And that leaves me with a times k minus lambda times k is going to equal the zero vector. And I can factor out the k. And I have to be careful here, uh, since I'm working with matrices and vectors. Um, I can't write a minus lambda, because that would be a matrix minus a scalar or just a regular number. So when I factor out the k, the lambda is actually multiplied by another matrix called the identity matrix, uh, which is a matrix where along the main diagonal you have ones and everywhere else you have zeros. And the identity matrix has the property that if you take a times any matrix or a times, I mean, i times any matrix or i times any vector, um, the product is that matrix or the vector that you're multiplying. All right, so, well, how does that help us? If uh, we now have this matrix vector equation, so a minus lambda i times the vector k equals zero, we neither know lambda nor do we know k. Well, we're going to start with the idea that we want a non-trivial solution. So in other words, this vector k cannot be identically zero. Some of the components can be zero, but not all of them can be zero. And that can only be true if the determinant of this coefficient matrix, a minus lambda i, is not zero. And so uh, for what uh, I'm sorry. If this coefficient may de determinant is not zero, then uh, k uh, could be the only solution is k equal to zero. So let's find the values of lambda where uh, it's going to equal zero. So let me go ahead and take off the not equals. That's not really what we want. We want this to equal zero, then this will have or this equation will have a non-trivial solution. So that will give us a polynomial in lambda. So it's a polynomial equation. If it's a quadratic equation or a cubic equation, uh, we should be able to solve it if it has rational solutions. And that's the type of equation we'll be dealing with. Higher order equations will ask us to do something different, uh, which would be beyond the scope of this class. All right, so this polynomial equation is called the characteristic equation. 
And uh, the solutions are called characteristic values or eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues of the character, I mean, the eigenvalues are the solution to the characteristic equation. And if uh, lambda is an eigenvalue, then any vector that, uh, so non-trivial vector k, which satisfies uh, our equation is called an eigenvector, right? So then the k cannot equal zero. So let me just emphasize that. Uh, we started off with that. We want a non-trivial solution. So we're gonna look for a non-trivial k, which satisfies that equation for that particular value of lambda. So for each eigenvalue, you're going to have a corresponding eigenvector. So if you ever taken a linear algebra course, this is a simple fact to prove, but we're just going to take it as a fact that if you have different eigenvalues, then the eigenvectors are linearly independent. So if you have a three by three system, x prime equals ax, and you get three distinct eigenvalues. So lambda one is different from lambda two, which is different from lambda three. They're all different from each other. And their corresponding vectors, k1, k2, and k3. Then the general solution would just be, well, I could even do this more uh, because it's not just the sum of the eigenvectors. You could also have any linear combination. So I could have a C1 times K1 plus a C2 times K2. I'm sorry, C1, K1 times E to the lambda 1T. C2, K2, E to the lambda 2T. And finally, plus C3, K3, E to the lambda 3T. So let's solve this system of equations using our matrix formulation, which is going to mean we're going to be finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we have a system of equations. Let's write that. Um, we write that in matrix form. Our coefficient matrix A is going to have entries 2, 3, 2, 1. We'll be making use of the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, because we have to calculate First, a minus lambda i. So that's going to have lambda as a parameter in that matrix. And then we'll calculate the determinant of that. And the determinant means, well, remember, you have to form the product of the main diagonal, subtract off the product of the anti-diagonal. So let's go ahead and multiply that out. We're going to set that equal to 0. And this characteristic equation or characteristic polynomial, uh, it can be factored and that gives us two uh, eigenvalues, negative one and four. So for each one of these eigenvalues then, I have to find the eigenvector. So let's start with lambda equals negative one. And let me just write that as negative one. All right, so then I'll have I'll go ahead and put that in to get my equation that needs to be solved. And uh, I see that I made a mistake here because I was using lambda equals one. Of course, it should be lambda equals negative one. So let's go ahead and make the corrections here. I think that, so it was two minus negative one that's going to give me different entries there. So I'm going to have a three. And then one minus name, this is going to be a two. So it's interesting that uh, we're going to get essentially the same solution, uh, even though when I made the mistake. So, oops, let's go back and make the changes again. 
we got three three is the first row and two two is the second row so this is a dependent system and that's what's always going to occur when you're trying to find these eigenvectors dependent system if you remember back from beginning algebra if you have a two by two beginning uh, dependent system that means that uh, if you were to graph these lines so you would get uh, two overlapping lines and that there's an infinite number of solutions and we're only interested in finding one of those solutions so uh, to help us find that uh, those solutions especially with three by three systems uh, it's worthwhile for us to do a review of uh, some of the steps in Gaussian elimination. We're not going to do all of the, the Gaussian elimination steps. We're just going to do enough to help us solve the problem at hand, which is to solve dependent systems of equations. But here we're going to have a system of equation which is uh, not dependent. And in fact, it's consistent, meaning it has a unique solution. So there's two things we're going to use. We're going to use this notion of row echelon form. In row echelon form, that means uh, every entry under the ith row in the ith column is zero. So in other words, in the first row and in the first column, I'll, I'll have zeros underneath there. So, and the next thing is that any rows which consist of all zeros have to be at the bottom. Uh, so, these three entries here, we want to make those zeros without changing the solution. Obviously, it doesn't help us if we just write down zeros. That changes the system of equations. We want to perform actions uh, on these rows, which will not change the solution to the equations. So those actions are called elementary row operations. And there's three of them. One would be to interchange two rows. So this is the notation I would use that row one and row two will be swapped. The second one is to scale a row by a constant or scale means just to multiply by a constant. So I would just write it this way that row two will be replaced with half of row two. And then the last one is the most complicated to write down, but it's still a very simple idea. You replace a row with the sum of that same row with a multiple of another row. So for example, I may replace row three with the sum of row three and minus two times row one. So these are the operations I wanna take in order to start with this, uh, array of numbers and put it into reduced, I'm sorry, row echelon form. Uh, and so notice that I'm just writing down the uh, coefficients and the constants. I don't need to write down the x, y, and z because of the location of uh, the, the numbers. So as long as I keep things in their proper rows and columns, then I don't need the x, y's, and z's or the equal sign. All right, so I've got my coefficients. And the first thing I'm going to do, because I'd like to have a one up here, it just makes things easier. It's not absolutely necessary, but it makes the other steps easier. Is, so if you have a row which starts with a run, a one, then you may want to swap that with the first row so that now your first row uh, starts with a one. And then from here, I'm going to apply two uh, row operations, which uh, are of the third type. So I'm going to replace row two with row two minus three times row one. And why did I select that? Because I want to get a zero here. So if I take three minus three, I would get zero. So I'll be multiplying this times three and then subtracting it. So what this does is the steps that you would perform in matrix elimination, I'm sorry, in systems of equations where you solve by elimination, but it just has a little shorthand way of writing it. 
And then row three, in order to get a zero in this location, well, I'd have to take two minus two. So I'll take this row and subtract two times the first row. And after I do that, I get a new array of numbers and I have zeros under this first entry in the first column. Now, now my next step is, well, I could multiply this one through by negative one. Um, that may make things a little bit easier. I'm going to leave it with a negative one. And I'm just going to say, you know what, if I want to get a zero here, what I should do is just take this row and subtract from it the second row. So take the third row, subtract the second row. And when I do that, then I've got zeros in all the locations I want. And now I can go ahead and write this as a system of equations with variables. And so these are my coefficients. So my first equation is x plus y plus z equals 3. Then I have no x term in the second equation. I would just have minus y minus 4z equals negative 11. And then in the last equation, I have no x term, no y term. So I have 4z equals 12. And now it's very easy to solve this starting from the bottom and working your way up. You would get z equals 3 y equals negative 1, and x equals 1. All right, so let's take a modification of that system. I've only modified the third equation. And uh, so now the third row of my array here has been changed. So my first operation is still going to be the same. I'm going to swap out. Uh, swap rows one and two. And then I want to get zeros under the first one. So I'll go ahead and apply the same row operation as I did before. I'll take, or I'll replace the second row with the sum of that row minus three times the first row. Uh, and for the third row, since I have a one there, I'll just replace it with itself minus the first row. And then you can see that there's something interesting going on here. Now, if I want to uh, go ahead and get a zero in this location, I should take this and subtract that. And I think I have a, a mistake here because when I take negative eight minus three, I should have got a negative 11 there as well. So let me go ahead and make that correction here. Oops. I want to get negative 11 down here as well. And then I'll subtract the second row from the third row. And I wind up with a row of all zeros. And so whenever you get a row or more than one row of all zeros, that's an indication that you have a dependent set of equations. And that means there's infinitely many solutions. So how would you determine that? Well, if I write this back with the variables, I would have x plus y plus z equals 3 negative y, negative 4z equals 11. But then here I just have 0 equals 0, which is an indication that z is a free variable. z can take on any value that you want, and that will give you a solution if you then use that in the other equations. So the way you find a solution, so a particular solution, uh, you would choose a variable for the, a value for the free variable. It's going to be z, and so I chose z equals zero. You may choose z equals one, or you may choose z to be some other value. Sometimes you have to think about what is a prudent choice of z. You always want to choose a value of z which will lead to integers in your solution. 
you'd like to avoid fractions if at all possible. Sometimes it's not possible. But uh, in this case, choosing z equals 0, I got integers for x and y. All right, so let's go back to our example. So we got our uh, coefficient matrix. And this time I have made the correction. And uh, I've, I've got my correct coefficient matrix. And I'm going to try to solve this. And I know that I'm going to get a row of 0. So let, let me start off by putting out the coefficients here, the, the array of coefficients. And I went ahead and scaled the first one to have a 1 there. And you don't have to do that all the time. It just helps you avoid fractions later on down the road. So I put uh, the, just divided the first uh, row by 3. And then I went ahead and with the second row, I replaced that with the sum of the second row and minus 2 times the first row. So I get a 0. And that gives me all zeros in the second row, which tells me that the first row says x1 plus y1 has to equal 0. But y1 is free. And uh, x1 has to equal negative y1. So I can choose any value I want for y1. I'm going to choose y1 to be a negative 1. That gives me x equals 1. Again, I could have chosen oh, y1 equals 0. I could have chosen y1 equals 1. Um, I just chose y1 equals negative 1. So my first eigenvector then has components 1, comma, negative 1. And that corresponds to the eigenvalue negative 1. So my corresponding solution would be the eigenvector times e to the negative 1t. All right, let's find the second eigenvector. Uh, lambda 2 equals 4. We are going to uh, get, again, another dependent system of equations. Let's see how x depends on y. That's really what we're asking in this 2 by 2 system. How does x depend on y here? So you can, uh, for 2 by 2 systems, you probably don't need to use all of this machinery uh, of Gaussian elimination, but I'm going to do it just to practice. So what did I do is I just said, let me just add the uh, first row to the second row, and that'll be my new second row, of course, which is all zeros. And that tells me that negative 2x2 plus 3y2 equals 0, and y2 is free. So I'm going to choose uh, y2 to equal to. I did that because I know if I do that, I know when I solve for x2, I'm going to get an integer value, because now I know that uh, 3 times 2 will be divisible by negative 2. So when I do that, I get x2 equals negative 3. There's nothing wrong with having fractions uh, as entries. Like I said, it's just awkward to check your work or uh, verify things. So my second eigenvector has entries negative 3 and 2, which means that my general solution is, well, I have my first eigenvector I have times a constant c1 times e to the power of the first eigenvalue times t. Then I have a second constant times the second eigenvector times e to the power of the second eigenvalue times t. So my second eigenvalue is lambda 2 equals 4, so I have e to the 4t. My first eigenvalue is lambda equals negative 1, so I have e to the negative t. All right. This x of t and y of t could be viewed as parametric equations of a curve in the xy plane. And so for each choice then of c1 and c2, you'll get a different trajectory or a different path or a different curve. And looking at those trajectories could be really very interesting. All right, let's solve a 3 by 3 system. And so we'll start by looking at the coefficient matrix. And then we're going to have to find the characteristic equation by evaluating the determinant of a minus lambda i.
So what does that really mean? That means that on the diagonal, you're going to have the same entries, but then subtract off lambda. Uh, if you're not sure how to evaluate three by three determinants, um, what we're going to use is expansion by minors. Uh, if you're not if, if you're not clear about uh, how that works, uh, just shoot me uh, a message and I will uh, give you a link to a different video which uh, reviews how to calculate these three by three determinants. So the idea is though, uh, what we're going to do is pick a row or a column. I'm actually going to pick the first column because it has the zero. So that is going to reduce my workload. So I'm looking at this column here. And then what I do is for each entry in that column, I'll come in and say, oh, okay, let me go ahead and cross out the first row and the first column. First column will always get crossed out. What's left over is a minor. So we're going to calculate the determinant here of what's left over and multiply that times the entry, the first entry there. Then we have to alternate signs. So there's this checkerboard pattern. So you start with a positive, then you go negative, then you go positive. If you want to cross the first row, it'd be positive, then negative, then positive. So that's why we have a negative one here. And now we're going to cross out then the uh, row and column associated with that. So it's always going to be that column that's highlighted. But now I'm going to cross out this row. What entries are left over? A 1, 1, a 1, and then negative 3 minus lambda. That is the determinant that will get multiplied by negative 1. And the same idea for the 0. I wrote it out just uh, for completeness sake, but uh, really um, we know it's going to be 0. So we don't have to calculate anything there. All right, so uh, I'm evaluating the two by two determinants, just again, using the product of the diagonals, subtracting off the product of the anti-diagonals. Did that in each case. And now I just have to multiply everything out and collect the like terms. But I'm gonna do this a little bit. Sometimes you wanna look for patterns. It's gonna save you some work. If you multiply all of this out, and then collect it and then try to factor it. It'd be a lot of work. But if you make some observations by looking what's inside the brackets, well, I notice that I have a common factor in each of these terms. I have a negative 4 minus lambda here. And then inside the brackets here, I have negative 4 minus lambda. So I'm going to make this problem really easy by making that observation and factoring out negative 4 minus lambda. Because then I'll have what's inside the brackets here and then a minus 1. Well, that's fantastic because I have a plus 1 and a minus 1 here, which will then leave me the characteristic equation in factored form. And so now I just have to set that equal to zero and solve. And so the first uh, eigenvalue is negative four, the second one is five, and the third is negative three. So let's find the corresponding eigenvectors. We'll start with the eigenvector corresponding to lambda one equals negative four. All right, so I go ahead and place these. Uh, values of lambda, and I get this coefficient matrix. I'm not writing the zeros anymore because whenever I do any operation, that last column of zeros is forever going to remain zero. So I'm not going to write that anymore. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go ahead and swap the first and second rows. So I have a one here. And then I've already got two zeros under that. 
So I don't have a lot of work to do for this eigenvector. And then I'll just replace the third row uh, with itself minus the second row. And that gives me a row of zeros. And now I can look and see what does that mean when I put the coefficients back on. That means that, well, z or z1 is free. y1 plus z1 equals 0. And x1 plus 9y1 minus z1 equals 0. So we're just going to choose a value for z that's going to be convenient. Um, I chose z equals 1. That makes y1 equal negative 1. And then x1 will equal 10. So my first eigenvector is 10, negative 1, 1. Let's do the same thing with the second eigenvector. Again, what did I do? Is I put uh, 5 in the place of lambda in my coefficient matrix. That gave me on the diagonals negative 9, 0, and negative 8. And so I'm going to use my elementary row operations to uh, try to get a 0 here and then a 0 there. I already have a 0 there. Now, again, it's going to be a lot easier to work with a 1 here in the first row, first column. So what I'll do is swap the first and second rows. And then to get the 0 in the first column of the second row, I'll just replace row 2 with row 2 plus 9 times row 1. And then I'm just left with getting a 0 in the third row, second column. And I can do that by taking the third row and subtracting the second row. And I get that third row of zeros. So when you're calculating eigenvectors, you should always get at least one row of zeros. It's even possible to get two rows of zeros. And honestly, in, in very trivial cases, you could actually get three rows of zeros. All right, so um, what does that tell me? That tells me that uh, x2 minus z2 equals 0. Remember, I'm not writing the right-hand side, but we understand that it's always 0. And then y2 minus 8z equals 0. And then z2 is free. So again, I get to choose a value of z2. I'm going to choose z2 equals 1. That tells me then that y2 equals 8 and x2 equals 1. So my second eigenvector has components 1, 8, 1. And we have one last eigenvector to calculate. Again, we're just going to put the negative 3 in the place of lambda. We'll get our coefficient matrix. And then we'll apply some elementary row uh, uh, operations. I'm going to stick with the negative 1 here. Uh, so I just went ahead and, and said, let me just take row 2 and add row 1 to it. And then I still need to get uh, a 0 here. So I am going to uh, go ahead and take uh, row 3 and subtract off 1 ninth of row 2. And that will give me this solution here. Uh, and if I put the coefficients back in, or the variables back in, I'll have negative x3 plus y3 plus z3 equals 0. And then the second row says 9y3 equals 0. So note that that means that y3 must be 0. y3 does not depend on x or z. It has to be just 0. However, z3 is free. It can take on any value. So uh, we'll choose a z3 to be 1. We know that y3 has to be 0 no matter what we choose for z3. And when I choose z3 equals 1, then x3 is going to be one as well. So now I've got all three eigenvectors, and now I can write down the solution, the general solution to the equation. So remember that is a constant times the eigenvector times the corresponding eigenvalue in the exponent. So here I have e to the negative 4t, and that's for all three terms.